So, welcome back to the channel, Coral Jacks, where we've been visiting ancient sites and delving into the history and folklore around them. This week, we'll be covering the Iron Age hill fort, Voil Dragan, a familiar and striking feature locally, as its silhouette can be seen for tens of miles around, dominating the east of the Priscelli Hills. We finally got some snow this winter, and we absolutely love snow, so we thought it would be great fun to get some footage of the hill. The roads were covered, and we passed a few people backing out on the approaching hills. The first route was impassable, but we were determined, and our skinny little tyres handled the second approach just fine. Being pretty local, we figured if we did get stuck, we'd just walk home. One and a half miles from Krimach, a small village in Pembrokeshire, the fortifications atop Vaul Dragan were built during the Iron Age, around two and a half thousand years ago. But the most prominent feature, top and centre, are the three Bronze Age cairns around which the fort was built. These cairns are over 3,000 years old and are often referred to as the Graves of the Three Kings. They give the hill its distinctive name, Voil Dragan, the Hill of Three Cairns. The main fort is made up of two roughly oval ramparts, an inner one encompassing the cairns and a large number of hut platforms, and a sprawling outer rampart stretching around to include a total of 227 hut platforms. This illustration by Toby Driver gives an idea of the scale of the site. Slightly different from the hut circles at St David's Head, which are marked by earth-fast boulders, these tightly packed terrace circles have no above-ground remains, so depending on the vegetation and weather, they can appear very subtle and easy to miss, but today they are clearly defined, the shadows contrasting with the fresh snow. Ten kilometres away, and in line of sight, are similar fortifications at Carn Ingley, which is in sight of Carn Vower, which in turn is in sight of the fort at St David's Head. I grew up imagining that these key mountaintop sites would send messages across the hills using flaming beacons. The idea is beautiful, simple and evocative, but sadly evidence of the practice this early is somewhat lacking. A map of hill forts in Wales and along the border shows just how popular this type of settlement once was, but although Voil Dragan is surrounded by many competitors, few can compare in scale and majesty. This was clearly an important strategic site, occupied and altered by large communities over huge expanses of time. A jewelled crown in a network of ancient structures, monuments and earthworks covering the Priscelli Hills and surrounding lowlands. So beautiful! <laughs> From Neolithic dolmens to Bronze Age cairns and stone circles, through to these Iron Age forts, these hills hold valuable reminders of our ancient past, important to our understanding of early society in Wales and beyond. So let's dig a little deeper into these cairns. It happens to be surprisingly common for Bronze Age burial mounds and cairns to be enclosed by later hill forts, such as Moyle Ventley in Denbighshire, Penaclothiae, Uskrid Vaur in Monmouthshire, Caira Tour on Hollyhead Mountain, and many more. But why are they within a hill fort? And why did the fort builders not simply rob them of their stones and contents? Well, it's often stated that the hill fort builders must have seen these great mounds as the seat of ancestral power. A Kovlin entry about the site states that the three cairns were never plundered for their stone, despite being surrounded by hundreds of houses. Could this mean that the occupants venerated their distant ancestors, while at the same time deriving power and social status from the acquisition of such a prominent and sacred hilltop? Certainly a powerful site to build a fortress, but were they really the graves of kings? Well, this paragraph from the 1900 Archaeologia Cambrensis seems vague to me, but has been interpreted as such. <coughs> Time for some fun. At Maesquin Mechlionog under Tregan is Clare Clathwid Mon, Mylan Amadog, the burial place of the three kings, Mon, Mylan, and Madog, in the grave Englinion in Skeen, four ancient books of Wales. There are four stanzas devoted to Moor, Myla, and Madog. According to the first of these, they are buried on a hill in Pant Gwyn, Gwynionach. Madog is said there to have been son to Gwyn of Gwynclwyg, Moor, son of Peredur of Penwedig, a district of North Cardiganshire, and Myla, son of Bruin of Brycaniog, 
but these names again appear in the triads, or rather, Madoc is there said to have been the son of Bruin. You'll have to excuse me on my pronunciation of some of those names, or possibly all of them. Let me know in the comments. Although the Cairns were not plundered during ancient times, we sadly cannot say that that was the case in our more recent past. The 1900 Archaeologer Cambrensis also says that the three Cairns have been much interfered with. The late Mr James Fenton spent some days in digging into one, but he abandoned the work before reaching the centre on accounts of the expenses incurred. All have been further pulled apart by treasure seekers, and the Ordnance Surveyors have built up a small supplementary cairn on top of the cairn itself. Visitors, moreover, seem to have amused themselves in mutilating these monuments out of pure mischief. Also, the farm on which are the graves of the Three Kings is occupied by Mr Stephen Putin, who imperfectly opened one some time ago, but observed in it only some charcoal. And things haven't changed that much in the last century, it seems, with visitors continuing to damage the site. Heritage Action hosts an article on WordPress stating that students from Pembrokeshire College joined the National Park Authority's archaeologists and rangers to help reinstate damaged Bronze Age burial cairns on the Briseli Hills. It's a criminal offence to alter the cairns without permission. However, visitors have been moving the stones to make shelters and the students have been helping to restore them to their original formations. National Park archaeologist Pete Crane describes the site to the uninitiated, these may just look like big piles of stones, but in fact these huge structures give the fort its name. Fordragan means the hill of the three cairns, and gives us a real picture of what an important feature this was at least 3,000 years ago. When Sabine Baring Gould excavated the site 125 years ago, they found Iron Age and Roman pottery, glass beads and sling stones. A quote from the Archaeologic Cambrensis of 1900 goes on to say, Outside the fortifications, below the rocks and the talus, are a good many indications of enclosures and appearances of hut circles, but some of the most conspicuous are modern reconstructions by shepherds. Of one of the hut circles excavated, it's said that wood charcoal was found strewn on a level 1 foot 8 inches below the turf surface, presumably the level floor of the dwelling. Resting on this ground, they found the following objects. Eight water-worn pebbles, one of these was white and semi-translucent, the size of a pigeon's egg, and another olive green, opaque and the size of a sparrow's. But these little pebbles were of striking appearance and would be picked up by anyone as being both pretty and out of the common. A rounded piece of baked clay, not pottery, a spindle wall of sandstone with ornamentation one and a half inches in diameter. They also excavated the fort, but only partially, they found objects which convinced them that the fort was occupied during the Iron Age. Many fragments of metal, highly oxidised, were discovered at considerable depths, associated with spindle walls, pounders of stone, sling stones, glass beads and portions of armlets and rings. Foyle Dragan is situated near the end of the Golden Road, a road thought to have been created by the Romans for military and economic transport. It follows the route of a much older road, which is thought to date back to the Neolithic period, around 5,000 years ago. This track was thought to be a main route for travellers in prehistory, to and from Ireland, and some theorise that the Pembrokeshire bluestones, used in the inner ring of Stonehenge, would have travelled via this well-trodden byway. Geologists have known since the 1920s that the bluestones at Stonehenge come from the Priscelli Hills, and in modern times there have been collaborations with archaeologists to locate and excavate the actual quarries from which they came. Khan Goydog was excavated and rocks were a match to the spotted dolerite bluestones at Stonehenge. Crag Rossavelin was also excavated and it's said that radiocarbon dating of burnt hazelnuts and charcoal from the quarry workers' campfires reveals that there were several occurrences of megalith quarrying at these outcrops. Stonehenge was built during the Neolithic period, between 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. Both of the quarries in the Priscelles were exploited in the Neolithic, and Crag Rossavelin was also quarried in the Bronze Age around 4,000 years ago. We have dates for around 3,400 BC for Crag Rossavelin and 3,200 BC for Khan Goydog, which is intriguing because the bluestones didn't end up at Stonehenge until around 2,900 BC. Professor Parker Pearson goes on to say, it could have taken those Neolithic stone draggers nearly 500 years to get them to Stonehenge, 
but that's pretty improbable in my view. It's more likely that the stones were first used in a local monument somewhere near the quarries that was then dismantled and dragged off to Wiltshire. Well, perhaps they were used as some kind of monument prior to their erection at Stonehenge. One tale of Arthurian legend connects Merlin with the construction of Stonehenge. He was asked by Arthur's father, King Uther Pendragon, to construct a memorial to his brother Ambrosius and the warlords of Britain killed by Saxon treachery in the massacre known as the Night of the Long Knives. The story goes that for the monument, Merlin travels to Ireland in search of the fabled Giant's Dance, a circle of stones which were believed to possess curative properties if the water in which they'd been washed was used to bathe the sick. After a great battle, Merlin conveyed the stones by magic to the shore of the sea, then floated them on rafts across to Britain and set them up on the plain near Salisbury. It has been suggested that this story may contain a distant memory of the method by which the ancient bluestones, quarried in the Priscelli Mountains far to the north, were brought by sea to the mouth of the River Avon and taken inland on huge wooden rollers to their present site. Of course, the Arthurian tale is set not in Neolithic times, but in the 5th century. There are strong beliefs, however, that these tales are retellings of much older legends handed down through oral tradition. Jumping right back to modern times, we'll end this video remembering the Bruider Preselli, the Battle of the Preselli. This simple sign at the base of the hill reminds us that locals had to fight to keep these hills freely accessible and protected from the destruction that comes with heavy military use. These mountains would not be accessible to walkers today if it were not for the brave stand by local inhabitants at the end of the 1940s. Soon after the Second World War, in November 1946, the War Office declared its intention to turn the Priscelli into a permanent military training area. That would mean turning more than 200 farmers from their homes. However, under the leadership of non-conformist ministers and local headmasters, a spirited campaign was organised to withstand the threat. A barrister was employed to represent the Priscelli Preservation Committee and it was made abundantly clear that not an inch of land would be surrendered. We nurture souls in these areas, was the precise comment of the Reverend R. Parry Roberta when confronted by military officers. The sanctity of the mountains was emphasised with their 38 bluestones transported to Stonehenge over 2,000 years ago to become part of English heritage. By spring 1948, the government had to give in to the determination of the people of the Priscelli. All present-day farmers and walkers are indebted to the heroes of yesterday. Waldo Williams wrote the poem Priscelli in a direct response to the threat of designating the Priscelli Hills as a permanent military training ground. Wall of my boyhood, Moil Dragan, Khan Guvri, Tal Manith, in my mind's independence ever at my back, and my floor from Whitwick to Warren and to the smithy, where from an essence older than iron the sparks were struck. And on the farmyards, on the hearths of my people, wedded to wind and rain and mist and heathery, live rocky land. They wrestle with the earth and the sky and they beat them and they tossed the sun to their children, as still they bent. For me, a memory and a symbol, that slope with reaping party, with their neighbours' oats falling forswathed to their blades. The last they took for fun at a run, and straightening their back, flung one four-voiced giant laugh to the clouds. So, my wails, shall be Brotherhood's womb, her destiny, she will dare it. The sick world's balm shall be brotherhood alone. It is the pearl pledged to time by eternity to be the pilgrim's hope in this little crooked lane. And this was my window. Those harvestings and sheep shearings, I glimpsed the order of a kingly court. Hark, a roar and ravage through the windowless forest. To the wall, we must keep our well clear of this beast's dirt. <laughs> With the sun in my face and the it's snow great. behind me. So we probably maybe we're being a bit ambitious driving today. 
<laughs> roads are mildly sketchy. <laughs> It's kind of it's pretty much like this path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only the main road didn't have snow all over it. But oh god. So See, rather than staying and getting another half an hour's worth of footage, we're uh, gonna head off and leave ourselves enough daylight just in case we do get stuck. In case I can't get stuck. We are kind of walking distance. Not before dark though, but <laughs> if we get a bit closer we'll walk a bit before dark. <laughs> There's the hill, lovely hill. Oh, oh, wrong way. Hill. But we did start sliding down a hill backwards yes. in the car. We did, uh, what would you call it? A, uh, <laughs> a spinning, <laughs> a, a mildly controlled spin in the road backwards downhill. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call it a turn in the road because it was mostly involved with sliding. And some other people gave up before coming down the hill that we came down to get here. And then I kind of encouraged them. So they started. And then we didn't see them catch up with us. <laughs> so. <laughs> I feel a little bit bad about that. They were just young guys though. Yeah. But we might get our uh, come up and by getting mm. stuck going back up that hill. Well, yeah, what are we going to do? Glandy Hill or this one? So the hill is. Landy Hill doesn't get much. Up there to that peak. Landy Hill's pretty shady. But when I was working at the college, they did keep it quite well treated. But the Gritter van, didn't he keep going down this road? He did. Uh, this was really flat for most of it. <laughs> <laughs> but. Mm. but, but. Yeah, I'm so I'm just trying to figure out the right angle to walk and talk. I don't look like myself when I. No, it's pretty tricky. That doesn't I'm look not. like me. This isn't what I look like. <laughs> you are. Makes my head look long. You be looking at stones again. Yeah, stones. <laughs> No, I just know it's like every time. Oh, people I do, do it, it like that. Every time I do this, I'll think it's quite close and there's snow in the background. It just makes my teeth look really yellow. Uh, 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 <laughs> no. white, white snow. This is the weather, isn't it? You pretend you've got a mate film when you're walking next to you. Right, Kev. I'll go. So, yeah, we're going to try and get home without getting stuck in the snow. Mm. Well, Kev will get out and push really, Kev. We've got to go. Ooh, can you see that mast mm. behind us? Am I showing the mast? Mm. We live, well, not docking ourselves, no. We're aiming for the other side of that mast. <laughs> oh, someone's got a little old oh, car. Not the only ones in a non 4 by 4 So it's that way behind me. 